And so, what about joy? What about joy? And we may wonder that. And it's relatively common in interviews or group interviews or for someone to say, what about joy? I'm, you're going on and on about suffering and I'm actually experiencing joy and it, I'm not even sure if it's okay. And to, to someone who might just peer in here from time to time like some of our neighbors uh, kind of look in on us or from afar, from a safe distance and look at people shuffling back and forth <laughs> staring at the floor <laughs> wrapped in blankets and it looks pretty grim <laughs> so the Buddha the Buddha also referred to it as a path of joy so he, he was he quite commonly contradicted himself he was quite happy doing that as a path of joy and his followers uh, you know the, the monks and nuns and, and the lay practitioners uh, they were how could you tell a follower of the Buddha radiance joyfulness it was, it was a mark of, 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 uh, of the path and it's interesting we well if you just think about Dharma in the West the last what is it 30 something years 30 few 30 something years a lot of emphasis on the mindfulness, on the being with. And then a little while later, sort of, okay, maybe we need to add some meta. And a big, big emphasis on, on kind of lubricating the practice with, with meta. And really the necessity of that, of the attention to the climate of kindness. And of course, we talk about equanimity. This meta equanimity are two of the four, what's called Brahma Viharas, divine abidings. And compassion is another one. So there's a lot of talk about these, loving kindness, compassion, equanimity. And sometimes joy doesn't receive the same emphasis, the same care of attention, really. So when the Buddha, and the Buddha did actually talk a lot about joy, and there are different kinds of joy, different kinds of happiness. <clears throat> so he talked about worldly and non-worldly happiness, worldly and non-worldly ha- joy, which is, sounds a bit strange, but uh, worldly and spiritual joy. And so not at all to deny the range and the kinds of joy that are available to us as human beings. But when we talk about spiritual joy or or dharma joy, it's joy, happiness, not based on the ego, not based on what I am getting, not based on being better than someone, on measuring up in a certain way. Also not based on sense gratification that's a little bit more subtle I'll come back to that later not based on sense gratification so it's joy that comes from cultivation of the beautiful qualities of of heart joy that comes from appreciation cultivating appreciation joy that comes from opening from connecting from perceiving beauty, from developing our capacity to perceive beauty, from the deepening of our practice, joy in practice itself, joy in the Dharma, joy in the teachings and hearing the teachings in the Sangha, in the community of people uh, who love to practice, who are interested in practicing. This is all Dharma joy, spiritual joy. And uh, very traditionally, this <coughs> third Brahma Vihara Mudita often gets translated as sympathetic joy, which what it means, and it's it means joy in the joy of others. So instead of envy or uh, feeling mm, why have they why have they got this and why haven't I got that, uh, it's delighting in the delight of others. 
and that's how mudita is usually translated. With, I feel it's a little bit too narrow of a translation. So really, this mudita, this spiritual joy, encompasses everything of what I've just said. You're welcome to come in, Melvin. Um, <laughs> I think it's fine right now. Thanks. Yeah. So <laughs> I hope you don't mind me speaking on your behalf. Here, but <laughs> okay. So maybe joy has a very significant and important place in the path. And may- maybe it really is something that we need to give attention to. There's deep nourishment. The being is deeply nourished through joy. It's very, very uh, uh, powerful and profound, the nourishment that comes from joy. One of the things we're doing in practice as well is we're reconditioning the mind and the heart. So, it may not sound that glamorous, but our minds, in a way, are run in loops. They run round and round in loops and habits. A lot of those are not very joyful. And we just have to sit a day in silence and witness some of those. See those loops, see those habits. They're not uh, br- joyful or bringing of joy. And a big part of what we're doing in practice is reconditioning those loops, just replacing these tired old loops that are not helpful, replacing them with joy. When we give attention to joy, we're actually making it it become so that joy moves towards becoming a habit. The mind finds finds a groove in joy instead of a groove in in unhappiness, in in, um, negativity, difficulty. Joy, happiness, is also purifying. So this is quite an interesting one. It may not at first be obvious. When we perhaps reflect or think, what does this mean? We hear about a path of purification. This is a path of purification. We tend to think, what is, what's purification going to look like and feel like? It's going to look like and feel like a lot of pretty nasty stuff coming up and out. And I kind of have to just sit through that <laughs> and bear with it. And the more miserable it is, the sort of better I'm scrubbing out the system. And, you know, maybe there's some truth to that, but I, I don't know. Joy brings openness. It's purifying. Joy is also clarifying. So a joyful state has a lot more clarity in it than an unhappy state, which tends to be quite confused, agitated. Joy brings this purification through clarity. It also brings purification because it transforms our intentions slowly, gradually, non-linearly over time. The more joy we have, just coming and going, the less, or rather, the more we feel we have enough. There's just more and more, very gradually, probably almost imperceptibly in our life, in our life of practice, more and more we feel like we have enough. The mind doesn't need to move out so much in greed, in envy, in doesn't move so much in, in the tight confines of stinginess. You feel like you have enough. It's purifying. It's purifying of the intentions. We have enough. It overflows. We can give. We feel we have enough. Joy also, in a very natural, organic way, moves towards equanimity. Its uh, natural movement in, in, the, in the fullness of time is to move towards equanimity, a beautiful, rich, deep equanimity. That's just the way joy matures. We talk a lot about equanimity and the ability to stay really steady, really spacious really present. It's an outcome of joy. It's one of the outcomes of joy. Shantideva, the great Mahayana teacher, said actually joy as well is an aspect of effort. It's an indispensable ingredient of effort. 
along with aspiration, being clear what, what it is that we're aspiring to in the path. Aspiration, confidence. Little old me might be able to get somewhere. Aspiration, confidence, joy and rest. But joy is very central. Part, part of what enables us to put forth effort on the path. Now we can assume, and this is, I think is quite common, that perhaps happiness is a bit superficial compared with the real heavy dark stuff that we need to deal with. That, I come across that quite a lot and certainly reflect on my own past, really feel that, that, that I was very much in that view for quite, quite some years. I really had to get in there and if I was working deeply, it was, that was when I was in contact with what was difficult. I was in contact with what was difficult. That was a sign that oh, this is really deep work. And the real work is through, you know, going through the hard stuff, which is unhappy. So just to ask all, all of us to ask ourselves, where is my assumption on that? What is my assumption on that? What do I assume about the nature of depth and happiness or unhappiness? What do I assume about transformation? that it's through, again, through this sort of difficult misery that it comes. And it can be that not so much unhappiness, although perhaps unhappiness, but just a lack of happiness can, can very commonly just be our normal state. Our normal state is actually not that happy. And then we take that, because it's normal, we take it to be natural. This is quite interesting. It takes quite a lot of, I'd say, investigation to see that actually unhappiness is more kind of pumped up. It takes more work to be unhappy than it does to be happy. It's not at all obvious at first, but once you really get into this, watching the back and forth between happiness and unhappiness, what's involved in supporting each takes quite a lot to support unhappiness how much thought is often involved in supporting unhappiness. We need quite a complex sort of, you know, structure of thought holding the unhappiness up. Then we might ask, do I, do I feel that joy is possible for me? Do I feel that it's possible in my life that joy can, can come as, as a frequent guest in the heart? Not be there all the time, of course not. It just can, do I feel that's possible for me? So all human beings are interested in happiness and we assume that we're interested in happiness. But I also feel that it's actually quite rare for someone to be, uh, I don't know what the word is, ruthlessly interested in happiness. <laughs> that the, it, you know, it's a cliche to say, um, we look in, in the wrong places for happiness, and we do, and we all know that, but it's, sort of, it's become meaningless. And we're bombarded with ad- advertisements saying, either deliberately telling us, or, or very unsubtly or, or subtly implying that you need this, or you need that, or you need to do this or that, or look like this or that to be happy. That's the kind of message. We're bombarded with that. And so in spiritual circles, or even self-help circles, or whatever it is, the it's a cliche to say we're looking in the wrong place. But it's actually quite rare, I think, for for someone to really kind of take this bull by the horns and say, let me get to the bottom of this question of happiness. Let me not let go of it. Let me go right, keep hanging on, and not settle for anything, anything kind of second best. And it may be, I think it is actually, it may be that an a full inquiry into happiness, into joy, turns out to be the same thing as an inquiry into freedom from suffering. That to follow one question to its end is to follow the other question to its end. So it's like two sides of the same coin in the path. <clears throat> so there's a lot of words, you know, joy, happiness, a lot of ranges of what that means, and I don't want to get too hung up on, on words tonight. 
but I just want to drop something in about another word, very briefly, fulfillment. There was a survey of parents, I uh, can't remember where or, or when, but, and it, it tested in, in some way their happiness before being parents and after being parents. And they, all, pretty common, pretty strong result, that they were less happy uh, once they were parents. <laughs> but, <laughs> fortunately, there was a little sophistication on the part of the psychologist. psychologist. They I had another question, rating their sense of fulfillment, and that was often much higher. So there's, what I'm trying to say is it's a complex picture here and not to sort of grab too much on one thing. If I think about teaching sometimes, you know, the truth is oftentimes it's very challenging, it's very hard. There's a lot about it that's difficult and tiring and all the rest of it. And yet, I would say without, I would never, I mean sometimes it's, it's totally joyful and it's a real joy to share the Dharma, and mostly it is. But um, I can, without hesitation, always say it's deeply fulfilling something profoundly for me, with all the difficulties. And before I was a Dharma teacher, I was a musician, and uh, in, in the later years, a composer. And the artistic process, if one really cares about creating something, you know, to really cares about what it is one's expressing, uh, a lot of frustration in that process, a lot of the nitty-gritty and the sort of really trying to get it right. Is that a joyful process? I don't know. Is it fulfilling? Yes. So, just to paint a bit of a bigger picture... And when we talk about joy, there's such a huge range. And all the way from someone literally feeling like they're going to burst in ecstasy. Uh, and, and that does happen. And actually there are people in this hall, I know, who have come to me and said something like that. Uh, more than once. A bubbly joy, still joy, quiet joy peaceful joy. The joy has so, so much of a range, so many textures to it. And I want to really talk about the whole thing, the whole, uh, the whole range. A lot of joy is actually not that remarkable. And I really want to include that tonight. So I don't want, if you're listening and you think, oh gosh, you know, I've never had that. Um, really want to include that because that's as significant. The whole range is significant. Someone was telling me, actually, in terms of this range of joy, that yeah, he, they were listening to a piece of music. Uh, you, probably many of you know it, Beethoven's uh, Ninth Symphony, and this, the Ode to Joy. It's the last movement, and so involved in it, and so swept up by it, and so overjoyed with it that afterwards, after the music had stopped. For quite a while afterwards, their perception of the world, it changed their perception so deeply for, for a period of time. Their perception of the world was that the whole world was joy. The whole universe was the expression of joy. So there's this huge range that's available. So I... It's all important and it's all good and not to fix too much on, on the extreme expression of it. But what would it be to experience half an hour of joy every day? If that, would that be possible? How would that influence our life? How would that impact on our life? I think it would actually be life-changing. So joy can relativize uh, a lot. You know, the presence of joy can relativize a lot, a lot of other things in our life. We talk a lot about letting go. We talk a lot about letting go and say, let go, just let go, just let go. But oftentimes we need something else to hang on to. 
We need something else to hang on to before we can let go. It's too much to ask someone who feels impoverished inside to let go of something. Of course they're going to cling. When we have when we feel nourished, when we feel we have enough, it's much easier to let go. There's a story, the Buddha once, you know, because they lived on arms, so uh, just receiving whatever they received for food that day. And Buddha went on arms round one day in a village, and uh, along with, he was next to a, a, another monk from a different tradition. And that monk got fed, and the Buddha didn't get fed. And this other monk kind of turned to the Buddha and said, now what are you going to do? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Big Buddha. <laughs> and, uh, and the story goes, there was uh, just a pile of straw there, and the Buddha jumped onto the straw, crossed his legs, and sank into meditation. Just before he sank, he said, feeders on joy are we. <laughs> and he was fine. <laughs> So, I just want to say, I'm aware, um, listening to this, that it can actually be difficult to hear. It can be difficult to hear about joy. Um, and especially when we hear about that range and we say, oh, gosh, no idea about it. Uh, and so for some people, that does come. And for others, it feels like totally alien to their range of experience. So it can be difficult to hear. And I really appreciate that. It can be can bring up for us uh, an awareness of, of the absence of joy in our life. Uh, again, like I said the other night, can there, can there be a, just, a, just a backing off of the measuring and just a listening to what's possible? So what I want to talk about in this talk, as I said at the beginning, was what nurtures joy? Can it be, uh, can it be something that becomes possible for us more and more? So one might be listening and have completely the opposite or in one's day here. There's actually sadness. There's unhappiness. Sadness and joy are dependent on the way we look, are dependent on the way we relate. So if there is sadness at any time, if there is unhappiness, just an experiment, an experiment. What if when there's sadness and there's unhappiness, one just very delicately, very lightly put the attention on the heart center, just in the center of the chest, very delicate, very light, a very allowing, delicate, open attention there, and just was with that sense of sadness. And in particular... In a, in a very sort of fundamental level, with its sense of unpleasantness, the texture of its, the difficulty of it. And Christina, I think it was Christina, talked about Vedna earlier, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. What if one just stayed very, very delicate, very open, very caring, with the sense of unpleasantness in the heart area, when there's sadness there? And if one could do that, and one had a connection, one was connected to that with presence, one was interested, kept, sustained an interest, and one was accepting, completely allowing of that sadness, of that un, uh, unpleasantness. And one was steady with those three things, connection, interest, acceptance, CIA, if the CIA is there. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's a stupid thing to say, but I, I would almost bet, I would almost wager that just slowly, gradually, if one can sustain that kind of relationship, it would turn into joy. Probably just a very, very quiet joy. So it's through the relationship through its dependent on our relationship that sadness arises and unhappiness arises and dependent on our relationship that, that joy arises 
So this, this really is an invitation to experiment with this. So even as I'm talking, you feel like, with, you know, I don't know. Uh, try, try this. The absence of aversion, the absence of aversion, the absence of pushing away and wanting to get rid of brings joy. So, I uh, remember a little while ago, I am um, sure I'm not the only person who's a bit sensitive to garlic. So, if I eat garlic in the evening or late at night, I find that I'm a bit, the body is quite restless and it's difficult to sleep. So this happened uh, a little while ago, and I was trying to sleep, and I had a busy day the next day or whatever, and just feeling of irritation with it, trying to sleep and not being able to. And then I just decided, okay, I'll just give in to it, and i just get up and just sat. And giving into it, non-aversion, then I got up, there was still the restlessness, but happiness came, instead of the irritation, the unhappiness. And it was all in, in, the, it's all in the presence of the aversion or not. So... Oftentimes, when we hear the teachings and when we might be hearing about this, and it's quite common to have the attitude of, yeah, but it's impermanent. Joy is, joy is impermanent. But I don't think that's enough. I'm not sure if that's enough. So, of course, it's impermanent, but I'm not sure that just kind of being afraid to develop it because, well, I don't want to cling to it because, you know, it'll all end in tears. Uh, I'm not sure that's enough. You know, there's a poem by William Blake. Um, he who tries think it's sort of like this. He who tries to hold to a joy does the winged life destroy. But he who kisses a joy as it flies lives to see eternity sunrise. And so often what we hear uh, in, in teachings, and, 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 and it's a very important part of the teaching, is actually just let it all come and let it all go. Unhappiness, joy, whatever it is, just don't cling. Let it come and let it go. But may, maybe there's more to it than that. So, yes, it's impermanent, but we can also cultivate joy. We can really cultivate joy. And both these approaches, this is really important, both these approaches are important. So at times we can be in a mode of practice where we're just letting everything come up and everything go. We're just into the impermanence of it, and that's totally fine. And other times we're very interested in cultivating the joy and we're deliberately in a mode of, of nourishing something, nurturing something. So it is impossible for anyone, even a Buddha, to have joy all the time. Even a Buddha is going to rest sometimes in equanimity. And uh, just... <laughs> turn it off for a minute. <laughs> uh, it's impossible to actually sustain. It's a condition and it doesn't sustain all the time. But uh, it can be more frequent. And it can deepen. And we can learn to sustain it. This is a little bit of a different approach to the teachings. We can actually learn to sustain joy. We can practice joy, we can learn that. And we need to understand kind of how to do that. Okay, great idea, sounds wonderful. How do I do it? How does it come? What nurtures it? What builds joy? What allows joy? How do I get out of the way? So the Buddha used this word a lot, skill. He used the word skill a lot, which is, it's not... For some people, it's not a very attractive word, but there's something extremely just compassionate and pragmatic about it. If we said the art of joy, it's a bit like, well, I'm not, I'm not really an artist. I don't really have that. But a skill is something that we can all learn. Wherever we feel we are, we can develop more of a skill at something. 
And something which even might seem impossible can become just through the gradual development of skill more and more possible for us. I remember when I, I must have been about six or seven or something, and every year we, we had um, my cousins in Italy, and we used to drive the whole family in the car uh, three days, um, which was interesting, um, across Europe to Italy through France and Switzerland. And somewhere, I don't remember where it was, there were, we stopped once, and there was a sort of go-kart track for ostensibly for kids but it was it had traffic lights and sort of you know complex road junctions and the cars had gears and all this stuff and I, I was however old six or seven and my younger brother just looked right at it and leapt into the <laughs> leapt in things <laughs> and zoomed off happy as as uh, you know Lewis Hamilton or whatever and I was completely just Overwhelmed and just, just completely, I just froze. It seems so complicated and so like, how do I even navigate this? And uh, of course, now driving is just well, don't even think about it. You just can drive and have a, you know, a complicated conversation with someone. It's just, just over time, it's a skill. Uh, that develops. I remember when I was learning to drive when I was 16 or 17, also feeling overwhelmed. It's just a skill. It's just a skill. And joy, in a way, is the same. So, one of my teachers, uh, Ajahn Jeff, talks about skillful attachment. And it's actually maybe worth, in a way, getting attached to what brings joy. We talk about non-attachment, letting go, maybe grabbing hold of what, what brings joy. And later, we can let go of joy too. But it will only be because we're letting go for something better. So he uses an analogy of ladder, a ladder, climbing a ladder. And you don't let go of one rung until you've grabbed hold of the other one. There's something that's helping our letting go, that's moving us on. That may not be an image that resonates uh, very comfortably with a lot of people because the notion of a ladder and holding on, it seems like goal-oriented and, and we could get really into that. Uh, I won't tonight. It's just, what's the views about that? Is there a place for that view in the path as well as this other approach. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. There's also room for another approach of let it all come, let it all go. It's all impermanent. Just let go. Don't cling. And we can move between these modes. So the Buddha talked a lot about what, what brings joy. And just repeating a little bit what we talked about the other night. Sila, this attention to ethics. And he talked about the bliss of blamelessness. It's just that we care so much about how, how we are in life and what we're putting out that we can rest in our own sense of goodness. and our, our, We can rest without worry about the repercussions of our actions. Will so-and-so find out what I said about them behind their back? Will they find me out about whatever it is? And there's a real foundation for joy there. Dana, I talked endlessly about dana and how much dana and giving, generosity, the generous heart is a happy heart. How much faith do we have in that, as I said the other day? So what feeds it? What also eats away at joy? So, some of it's really obvious. Worry, and it's, you know, worry is something we really have to learn in practice. And it's a gradual learning. We learn how to how to work with worry in a way, draining it of its energy. There's some things in life, you know. There's such a cultural agreement about worrying about certain things, like money, for instance. So everyone. Uh, and it's understandable. I don't, want to pl I don't want to dismiss it or play it down, but it's, it's, everyone is agreeing that we need to worry about money and investments. And have you, have you got the right, you know, 
interest rate and portfolio and all this stuff. And it can be that one needs to actually be really firm with oneself about worry, and particularly things like money worry. Just, I'm, I'm actually not going to do that. I'm really going to just cut it off. I'm going to practice generosity. Something that's going against that grain. Because it has such an inner momentum and such a cultural momentum. And once we're swept up in that, it will eat away the joy. I'm not saying that's easy, but sometimes it's like a kind of firmness with ourselves is is really important. So eaten away by worry, by uncharitable inner attitudes. So envy, greed, or the opposite of this sympathetic joy. Sort of someone else achieves something or does something really well, and we we say. Yeah, good, but we're sort of a little bit putting them down. And we can see ourselves doing this. It's so interesting just to watch these. They're just little movements, but they're so common. They're so repeated. We, we all have this. And can we just notice they're happening and then just, just put the other movement in? Celebrate. Uh, take delight in the achievements of others and the success of others. judging um, yeah, years it must have been at least 10 years ago <coughs> when, I, when I was a composer and I had this piece performed in, in America and I was present at all the rehearsal processes with the, with the orchestra and such a sort of intense process of making sure everything was right and every little note was exactly balanced with, you know, the oboe was balanced with the flute and not too loud and you got the exact rhythm right and all this really, really intense, precise attention to detail, wanting it to be just right and just uh, exactly what what I had in mind. And the concert came and sitting, listening to the concert with the same attitude of, um, you know, oh, okay, that was wrong and that wasn't quite balanced. And it was quite a unjoyful experience actually to sit and, and you know basically on the edge of my seat and, <laughs> and noting you know making mental notes of all the little mistakes everyone made and then a few days later I went to visit some other friends who are musicians in New York and um, and we went we just saw this advertisement for it was an Arab Arabic music concert in Brooklyn Public Library and we just thought cool you know let's 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 go see that and it was really long it was like hours and hours i think it was all day and we went and it was this in the huge library and you know different sort of acts would come on and, and arabic poetry and cuz didn't understand arabic at all or whatever but the scene was families and kids and picnics and grandmas and and lots of noise and just a whole big scene together. And I remember sitting there and sort of taking in the whole beauty of the life unfolding. And of course what was very much absent was this critical, you know, right, wrong, that wasn't quite good enough, etc. And such joy and delight and, and appreciation of just the beauty of humanity sort of coming together and and, uh, and and living and life just just manifesting. Is it? Would it be possible? Uh, maybe not easy. Would it be possible to have a real precision of the critical faculty, both inner and outer, without the aversion, without the worry, without the fear? without the judgment and keep that there so that there can there can be both this real discernment and, and an openness to wonder and joy I think that is possible so one huge part in, in nurturing joy is not overlooking it this is really what I want to stress because it can feel like it's a long way away not overlooking joy, not overlooking what it is that brings joy and what there is to appreciate. 
So we re- really need to recognize joy and recognize what there is to appreciate. We can incline the attention, incline where where we put our intention, we can incline towards what brings joy. So, right here in the retreat, and I think I spoke about this briefly in the opening talk, can we take care of our heart and our mind by actually deliberately inclining the awareness towards seeing the beauty here. There's a lot of beauty here. Seeing what there is to appreciate here. Seeing the goodness here. How much goodness is here? Just at Guy House. How much kindness. The immense work that the, the managers do. The generosity of the managers just taking care of all of us. Actually, Guy House kind of runs on kindness. I say sometimes it just kind of wobbles along, you know, strung together by kindness. It may not look like that, but that, there's a lot of kindness behind behind what goes on here, through what goes on here. Can we incline the awareness to see that deliberately? The generosity, the love, it's, it's all here. It's totally here. So sometimes to look around you uh, when you're in the dining room, when you're just going about in, in, in the house, and just see who else is here. Who's practicing here? How lovely that we're here together practicing, that we're supporting each other. If they weren't here, how much more difficult it would be to practice. Incline the mind. Oftentimes, too often, the habit of the mind is the other way. Fault finding. What's, what's What's irritating? What's wrong? What's the problem? What's difficult? You just need to incline the mind. It's going against our habit. It's going against our habit and we need to just, as I said, make new habits. So it takes some work at first. But you can really play with it. So the other day I was just playing around with this and I I was coming from something, I can't remember what it was, but I was a little bit irritated at something. And I was driving and I just said, okay, let me play with this. And driving along the road and going one way and of course the cars on the other side going the other way and I just reflected how lovely that the other cars don't deliberately swerve into my car (laughs) in a way I was just being silly with it but it actually really worked it was quite interesting and I was really appreciating the fact that you know, I can walk out there, I can drive out there, and yeah, of course bad things happen, and of course there are nasty people out there, of course. But actually, pretty much, on the whole, people are not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> you can play with this stuff. You can re- so there's, there's a real element of play and experimentation, activity in practice, like shaking things up, shaking things up, and you can have fun with it. It's interesting too, long-term retreatants oftentimes spend so long in this very refined atmosphere here, a very lovely atmosphere. And we talk all the time about love and mindfulness. And, <laughs> and, then, and then they go, <laughs> you know, to Newton Abbott or whatever it is. And it's like... <laughs> and they care, it's very common for judgmentalism to come in. You know, one really has to guard against that. Really has to guard against that. Incline the mind towards what is beautiful, to seeing what is beautiful. The Buddha's words, remaining percipient of the beautiful. It means exactly what I'm talking about. So, you know, people make their gardens beautiful. Just really small stuff. Actually, it's significant. The managers uh, sometimes get this newspaper. It's called Positive News. I don't know if many of you know it. It's it's actually, an, it is admittedly a, it's only a few pages, but <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know the Times on Sundays. Sort of. <laughs> but actually, it's it's all full of of positive news, lovely things that people are doing. You know, whereas you flick through another newspaper, you put the news at ten on, it's kind you know. And so we're just inundated with that. We need to take care of this. Where are we inclining the attention? 
So very important too, appreciating one's own good qualities. This is absolutely huge. And how often we don't take care of this. Can I appreciate my own good qualities? Can I see, just being here, just being here, all the effort that gets put forth, all the willingness, all the courage, all the steadiness, everything, can I appreciate that? Not to overlook it. It's absolutely indispensable as a foundation for joy. Um, a friend, actually he died recently, but a friend I had was a psychotherapist and he worked uh, with many different kinds of clients and one group he worked with was addicts of different kinds, uh, people with different kinds of addictions. One of the ways he would work with addicts in particular, w one of the pieces that he would do with them, was he would ask them to make an inventory of things they were grateful for. And so they would come every week and he would say, here's a piece of paper, come back and write, I forgot what was it, ten things or something that you're grateful for. And almost without exception, the reaction was, I'm not doing that, stupid. And yet, often they would do it and would report, wow, what a difference that made. And it's just this inclining the mind towards what we have to be grateful for. Huge is the power of gratitude. And not just for addicts, obviously. And a lot of it is about having a buddy and touching base with them, I think, every day even, and just saying to them, is it one thing that you're grateful for that day? One thing that touched your heart? One thing that was appreciative? And what a difference it makes. What a difference it makes. So, there is the place in practice for being with what's difficult. Of course there is, and opening to it, and being patient, and being uh, kind with what's difficult. And we talk a lot about that. Definitely, definitely, really important. And there is also the place of inclining the mind, shaking it up a bit, doing something different. Inclining the mind towards gratitude, appreciation, beauty, etc. They're both important. Again, what's the assumption? Does one sound superficial? So what else leads joy? The other divine abidings, the other Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, brings joy. Over time, it brings joy. It brings joy into the heart. It brings happiness into the heart. Compassion also brings happiness. So this is an interesting one because oftentimes even people on retreat feel like, oh, compassion is a bit scary. You feel like you're going to be overwhelmed with the sadness of the world. But actually, if one, one works with the, the art of compassion practice, it's actually a very happy practice. There's a lot of happiness there. One needs to know how to work with it. Compassion brings happiness. The wish to serve others. Again, Shanti Dev, when he talks about bodhicitta, this uh, desire, this overwhelming desire just to, to give to others, to work for the benefit of others, and, and what joy that brings. And he talks in very dramatic language, but again, it can be very undramatic. If anyone's either seen or, or heard Mother Teresa, tremendous amount of giving and such joy in it. She talks a lot about the joy in the giving that needs to be there. So, what else? Mindfulness. When there's mindfulness, attentiveness, presence, with curiosity and the curiosity of investigation, that can be there. And a kind of energy with that, that we're injecting some energy into that. That brings joy. It's actually quite similar. The Buddha taught us a little formula. Mindfulness, curiosity of investigation, and the energy that comes with that. And just stay with that, and, and joy comes. And again, it might not be that remarkable, but that doesn't matter. So is it possible sometimes when we're sitting and say, yeah, I'm mindful, I'm here. Can we inject, mm -hmm. can we inject our attentiveness, inject our mindfulness with these qualities? 
curiosity, investigation, energy. So one thing that becomes really significant in this is actually attention to joy itself. Attention to joy itself. The Buddha said, in a very significant quote, whatever one frequently dwells upon, that will become the inclination of the heart, the inclination of the mind. So to, to really reflect on the implications of that, if we, if we dwell on joy, pay attention to joy, it becomes the inclination of the mind. So when there is joy, and in the whole spectrum of what I'm talking about, and please, please remember that, very undramatic, unremarkable seeming to you know the whole range of your you know peeling yourself off the ceiling. How does it feel in the body? It's really, really significant. How does it feel in the body? So, joy, happiness actually does have a vibration in in the body, has a has a resonance there, reverberation. And if we can tune into that and just hold that in our attentiveness, remember, even if it's just nothing particularly strong just have a look see what's there in the body how does the mind feel but particularly how does the body feel and just tune into that vibration it's a way that builds joy and through that we become more and more familiar with that more and more familiar with happiness it becomes more and more accessible to us and it deepens it goes on a journey of deepening so it's interesting when there's joy there, you know, to whatever degree, what feeds it and what doesn't. And I know for myself and many retreatants have uh, come to me and reported, you know, there's a, so much joy, I feel like dancing. And oftentimes people do. And sometimes very early in the morning, uh, no one else is up and, and yogis are dancing down the corridor. <laughs> you get up early, you open your door and it, you think you're on the set of Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. But um, a person may really feel like it, it's, it's, one tunes into it in the body and it actually feels like it wants to express or, or one's in the fields and one just feels like wheeling and turning in the fields and it's there and it wants to come out. Again, experiment with this if it's there and it feels strong. Move. See what that's like. Does that, what does that do to the joy? And then there's also the experiment with just really being still with it and letting it kind of um, grow, letting it uh, build inside. So all this, there's a lot of experimentation with all of it. But the attention to how it feels is, is really important. Yikes. Okay. So this spiritual joy, what the Buddha called, and sometimes this physical aspect of joy is called piti, and it can come also out of concentration. It's a pleasure that's not based on the senses. It's not based on sense pleasure. So this, this is quite a significant point. So it's not that we're clo- we want interested in closing the senses, but there is, I think, in practice, as it matures, a a maturing of the relationship with sense pleasure. And so, rather than being hungry for it and, and sort of reliant on sense pleasure, it's we can be open to the pleasure through the senses, but it's actually a sense of wonder or mystery through the senses that we're tuning into more and more. Rather than the aspect of it being pleasant or unpleasant, lovely taste or lovely this or that. There's something that's available through the senses, different than pleasure, different than sense pleasure, that's actually deeper and more nourishing. It has to do with wonder. That we see something, the rain, maybe rain's not that pleasant, there's a wonder in it. Not dependent on pleasant and unpleasant, dependent on something else. But we can develop this physical feeling of joy and and again this is talking about long term practice now by giving attention to it it can seem like it comes out of concentration sometimes and that's true 
But it also comes out of, or what it really comes out of, is non-entanglement. When we're not entangled with what's going on, when there's openness, that allows joy, allows happiness. And it can be, it can come to the point where one really feels one has a choice with this. So something difficult goes on. I remember about a month after 9-11, living in America, and the U.S. Uh, Army invaded Afghanistan. I felt really sad, uh, saddened by that. But I had just been on retreat a while ago, and there was a lot of access to this happiness. And it was just interesting to notice that I could actually just decide to be sad or happy. You don't have to be a victim. There's actually some choice. Not always one would have this choice. Training the mind and the power of training the mind. This is available. This is available. sure about time, but are we still okay-ish? Yeah. Um, talked the other night about the three characteristics, the impermanent, contemplating impermanence, contemplating unsatisfactoriness, and contemplating things being not self. And the more we contemplate that, the more joy it brings. You can actually see this. So they're not depressing. There's a letting go. If we really inquire into joy, we realize that joy and wonder, wonder being an aspect of joy, one of the faces of joy, it's kind of inversely, so to speak, related to the, how much selfing there is going on. So the more self-concern, the more self-view, the less the capacity for wonder. So to really see this, that there's something in letting go of the self-view, releasing that, letting go of the identification actually allows joy allows wonder in particular in particular gradually as the, as the path progresses we open more and more to a joy that's not from things so that's a lot what the three char- contemplating three characteristics has, has to do with letting go of our addiction to things and our dependency on things to give us a sense of well-being and okayness and happiness. So not to dismiss things and the beauty of things and objects and sense pleasures and all that, but actually one, one eventually realizes their limitation in, in a very real way. So there's that story of the frog that lives in the ocean and he visits a frog that lives in, in a puddle and the, the frog in the puddle wants to say look at, you know, look at my puddle, it's pretty neat, isn't it? and the ocean frog says, yeah <laughs> he says, and the puddle frog says, where do you live? and he said, well, pff, you'd have to kind of come and check it out I can't really explain and it's a little bit like that I mean, it may, it's something that we mature into in a very natural, organic way as the path deepens. So letting go of things and our dependency of things can sound bleak, but I really don't think it is. How much unhappiness is there in the world because one believes I need something to be happy? So it's not actually the fact that I don't have it, it's the fact that I believe that I need it. And it may, in itself, it may not have anything to do with it. So very often, for example, money or relationship. There's so much hype about romantic love in our culture. And so a person who doesn't have that very often feels, I I need that. But maybe that's not the actual thing. Maybe it's just the belief that they don't have something which they feel they should have or need to have. A bit more investigation. one, again, very naturally develops a a joy in absence comes, a joy in absence. And it's not based on aversion. There's there's a poem I really love by Rumi, a very short poem. It says, 
Come to the orchard in spring. There is light and wine and sweethearts in the pomegranate flowers. If you do not come, these things do not matter. If you do come, these things do not matter. Something about our relationship with things changes and the joy is not dependent on the things, beautiful as they are. It's part of the unfoldment of the path. As through the movement of cultivation, cultivating joy, as, as joy comes and goes and comes and goes, and happiness comes and goes, we begin to notice too how our sense of things and the perception of things actually changes depending on whether there's happiness or not there. We see the emptiness of things and our perception of things. Looks this way if I feel happy, looks this way if I feel unhappy. We begin to lose our infatuation with believing that things are a certain way. Depends on the mind state. We see that through the coming and going of happiness. So just finally, there is of course the joy of freedom joy of freedom, not being dependent, the joy of release, not being bound in, in the self, in defining the self, in defining the world, not being bound by things, the joy of freedom, the joy of emptiness. One of my teachers, Ajahn Jeff, used to, very, is very fond of saying, the Buddha was someone who did not let go. He did not let go. in his search for the highest happiness. So he actually clung to that where most of the rest of us would actually let go at some point. So, oh, okay, I'll settle for this. He actually did not let go in his search for a deathless happiness. And also, as my same teacher, Ajahn Jeff, says, all the happiness that we experience in life, we're going to die. How good can it be if it all ends in death? And so to, to really go, it, is it possible to find a happiness beyond the things of life? A joy beyond the things of life? Sometimes the mind just boggles with that. Or what? We're after death or, or what? What does it mean? But how good can it be? However good it gets, it's going to end. It's going to be wiped out by death. What would it be to take the inquiry into joy that deeply? So in a way, how tenacious, how ruthless, with, with kindness, of course with kindness, how honest, how thorough uh, might we be in, in questioning the kinds of joy and the kinds of happiness there are. Because as I said, there are, there, there's a huge range of it. There is, of course, happiness in sense pleasure. There's happiness in, in being somebody important in the eyes of others, in praise. There's happiness in winning something and competing. Just knowing the whole range, really letting ourselves experiment and taste the whole range, keeping that inquiry alive so that we know. And it's not what a teacher says or the Dharma says or an advertisement says or this says or that. We know in our, in our hearts about the kinds of joy and what, what's, what feels the best. And it's not coming from should not coming from should. We know it in the heart, we know it in the life, we know it in the cells. And what I really want to say is that joy, like all aspects of the Dharma, is an inquiry. And not to feel like it's impossible. It's a skill and an inquiry and it's available and it has a whole range to it that we can explore and we can learn what it is that, that nourishes that. This is, is, is available to us. Let's sit for a couple of minutes here.